so I understand you're a, a UFO researcher, and I guess regarding the Westall incident, you are you're the guy. You you <laughs> you you've done the hard yards of research, um, and and you really know this case from kind of all angles that that have been presented. Um, how maybe you could start with just a little bit about yourself and um, how you got um, interested in the UFO phenomenon. Uh I don't really consider myself a UFO researcher, but I guess it sort of happened by default over the years because I obviously started looking into this flying saucer incident from 1966. And the original in to the story was simply a conversation that I had with a lady in Melbourne that I boarded with. When I moved down to Melbourne from Shepparton, where I grew up, I went down to Melbourne to study at Monash University. And I boarded with this lady who had opened up her home over the years to students, both Australian and international students. And she had lived in, that was Mulgrave in Melbourne, and she had lived in that part of Melbourne for, for years and had just recently retired as a very long-serving infant welfare nurse in what was then called the City of Waverley. And um, at some point, after I moved in and we became friends and I was going to university, she shared with me this story about this flying saucer incident that she had heard from good friends of hers who, as it turned out, had, I didn't really know it at the time, but they had a student at Westall State School at the time. Sometimes people forget that the Westall incident actually involved two separate schools that shared a boundary, a primary school, where the secondary school called Westall High School. Uh, her friends had a kid, a son, at Westall State School. He had been there that day, came home with a story, told his parents, and they at some point had told my friend, Elva, who I, had, who I was living with at the time. And I remember at some point we went for a drive over to Westall from where we were in Mulgrave, it wasn't very far, about 15 minutes in the car, I guess. We did a bit of a drive around didn't really know what we were looking at. We could see the schools and and that was about all. And then we went home and and I then, you know, really just forgot about the story until years later when I has when I was then living here in Canberra, I was looking around for a story to base a book on for young adults. And I remembered this story that I'd been told years before, which had as its protagonists, its characters, mostly school kids and, um, and some other people like teachers. And I thought, gee, that would make a good story uh, to write a book of fiction based on apparently, purportedly true events. And so I started doing some research into it. Uh, I eventually made contact with some of the people who were there that day. And it was mostly through a couple of articles that were placed in the local newspapers in and around Clayton South where Westall is located and people contacted me and one or two contacts led to four or six and that led to 10 or 12 and and then uh, there was a large article that went into the Age newspaper, the Sunday Age, it was a page three, quite a large article by the Age's, the Age's science writer. And he did an article about the story and my research into it. And that led to even more people contacting me. And it also rather fortuitously led to Rosie Jones, the Melbourne filmmaker, who was an avid reader of the age, of course, seeing that contacting me, she flew up here to Canberra. We had a chat at the National Film and Sound Archive about the story and my interest in it. And she went back to Melbourne and then a few weeks later contacted me and said, Shane, I'm really interested in the story, uh, your own interest in the story and the contacts you're making with witnesses and, and on the story. And she suggested maybe making a documentary about the incident, my involvement in the research. And that eventually led about four years later, I guess it was, to the documentary Westall 66, A Suburban UFO Mystery being finished and and then being broadcast on tv in australia mm. um 
You've, I've, I've spoken to a few witnesses, um, one on this podcast and a couple on the phone. Um, each account is unique and each account is very much there, th just, just what, what they have experienced. But uh, having listened to some of your talks and, and seeing the, the documentary, um, the story, th th there's a bit more to it. Every, every little jigsaw piece is uh, another little contribution to the weird series of, of the weird event or series of event around that uh, incident. I'm just wondering, what are your overall impressions of what happened on that day? Well, my impressions are very much, as you alluded to just there, that it's an absolute, uh, partly because, you know, unlike most UFO stories that involve one or two people seeing something often at night, something like anomalous lights in the sky, this one, of course, happened in broad daylight, starting at about 10, 15 in the morning for the people at Westall. Um, and it involved hundreds of people, literally hundreds of witnesses from both of the Westall schools, students and some of the teachers, and of course, people living nearby, people who lived in and around Westall, people who were working in and around Westall, and people who were living a bit further afield, and uh, people even at several other schools in the local area who were also witnesses, as it turned out. And so a big job in terms of researching something that happened so long ago before I was born and involving so many people and uh, involving something anomalous in a way, something that was obviously for the people who were there, unexpected, uh, out of the ordinary, literally out of the blue. And of course, people, depending on what their age was, personality, when they came uh, into the scene, how interested they were or not, People have different memories and have different had different experiences at the time. So I started off really thinking that the story was possibly something that was more of an urban legend, as stories often are, with you know possibly a, a kernel of truth, but with lots of accretions that have been laid on top of it over the years by just the passage of time and and it's just a natural thing that human beings do either consciously or unconsciously. But as I managed to make contact with quite a substantial number of people, and I was able to get a sense of the common denominators that were in their stories. Yes, there were differences, some differences of opinion, and as I mentioned, differences in timing and location. But it seemed to me that there were a vast number of common denominators, common elements in the story that they were telling. And for many people, it was the first time they had stopped, told the story, literally since it had happened after 30, 40 years. And so I became convinced that obviously something had happened. And to the vast majority of people who were there and who were gracious enough to share their memories with me, it was something that they held even to this day after so many decades had passed. It was for them, uh, almost to a person, something mysterious, something that they thought of as being out of this world, if you like, not necessarily out of this world in the literal sense of it being extraterrestrial, although some people certainly lean in that direction, and I'm certainly open to that as well, but out of this world in terms of the world as the people who were there that day had hitherto understood it, experienced it, and so it was something baffling. And then I would make contact eventually with people who were not just there as witnesses, but had somehow been drawn into the incident as representatives of different government agencies. And so it became clear to me that this was not something that had just happened to people passively, response to it, uh, response to it by police, fire brigade, ambulance service, the military, certain government departments, the civil defense organization. So it dawned on me gradually and fits and starts that 
there were, as you're suggesting, lots of layers to the story. And mm. even though I've been in contact now with, uh, I'm just looking at my cheat notes here next to me, um, something like 226 of the students who were there at Westall High School that day. And there were about 485 kids at the school that day. And something like 57 of the kids who were there at Westall State School out of the several hundred who were there. That's a very large number, of course, but it reminds me as the researcher that there's still a lot more stories out there, a lot more people that I haven't been in contact with. Mm. And so there are potentially um, more pieces to the puzzle that I haven't yet unraveled. Mm. Um, so having watched you you speak in a number of different interviews, you, you seem to really just stay to stick to the facts of what happened without um, taking any giant leaps or bounds, which I, I really think is very much you know needed in this space. It, it doesn't take uh, very long before the absolute supernatural enters the conversation uh, in many, many cases. But I am wondering, having had such a thorough investigation that you've done, what do you think it was? Well, I mean, that's the $100 million question or whatever denomination you want to put on it. And it's the question, of course, that people often ask me. And it's the question that I ask myself every day because it's the question that I've struggled with from the beginning. And it's the question that I struggle with as I sit here talking to you today. And I always try to be open with people and honest and clear and say, I don't know what it was. I feel for myself confident in saying that it wasn't something prosaic. It wasn't something ordinary that was somehow by so many people in broad daylight simply misconstrued or misunderstood. I feel it as though it certainly was something that presented in the way that people have over and over again, now in their hundreds, 30, but it was an object that seemed to be made of metal. And of course, some people are very clear that there was more than one. Quite a few people remember there being three of these UFOs, unidentified flying objects. So it was an object that was flew, that flew, that it was appeared to be an object. They couldn't identify it, but looking at it and remembering back onto their memories, they then at the time and still now often refer to it as a flying saucer because that was the parlance at the time. It gave that appearance like a, a bowl sitting on top of another bowl joined at the rim with a bit of a dome on top that it flew in ways that seemed unusual, beyond unusual, extraordinary, without any sound or, or virtually no sound, that it flew with angles and at speeds, uh, with manoeuvres that no one had ever seen before or since, even after the passage of all these years. So for the vast majority of people who have been in contact with me, they perceive it as being something really anomalous. Certain people give it certain interpretations. For some people, it seems to, to them that it was something from another planet. And of course, those of us who have delved into the UFO phenomena realize that there are lots of different interpretations uh, for the, the literally thousands of UFO sightings and experiences that have happened over the decades around the world. And whether you want to refer to it as, you know, put it into the category of being extra temporal or extra dimensional or extra solar, extra planetary, or whether it's something from our own world that some sort of natural or very unusual phenomena, you know, all of those solutions are there still to be nailed down, I guess, and to mm. be uh, decided upon. For you, me, I have You must have your own speculations though, right? Yet. You must have your own speculations. Well, one can speculate until the cows come home. <laughs> that doesn't make it true. It doesn't make it real. Um, and so for me, you know, if I'm to play a, an open to do, I just don't know what it was. As I said to you, I feel confident in saying it wasn't anything prosaic. So not an aircraft, mm. not a balloon of any sort, be it 
meteorological or radiation sampling or not a drone or a, um, a model aircraft of any sort. Um, none of those prosaic things. And the fact that there was such a response to it by government authorities right. obviously raises the spectre of it being either something that was literally out of this world and so there was an interest in it or that it was something that belonged to the military or the science establishment of a particular country, be it Australia or, or another country like the US, and uh, that it was something experimental like that. And that's why there was such a strong response to it. But um, I'm not sure that's the answer and I'm still looking for the answer. Mm. I feel like having been so long ago, 57 years um, this year, uh, the military experimental technology um, doesn't hold as much weight as if it were possibly something that happened within the last 10 to 20, maybe even you know 30 years. Uh, I, 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 f I personally feel that we would have seen a lot more um, you know, fingerprints of this kind of technology uh, rolled out throughout some of the many wars that the US has taken part in uh, over the last 57 years. Um, and Australia. And Australia, yeah, sure, sure. Um, so, yeah, I, 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 I think I, I, I don't... I don't buy that that explanation. But again, but this is pure speculation. I've I've got no idea what what the hell it was. Um, what were some of the other really strange things that kind of stood out? I've I've, I've had a conversation with Joyce, and she recalled uh, the object flying over the school, um, popping over to the Grange landing. She didn't jump the fence uh, and see it firsthand, but. Um, but you know her her account is very it's very compelling. But there were there were people that were closer. There were people that were in the Grange that um, playing on the playing with bikes, playing playing on the um, you know just around the trees and things that saw this mm, thing land. Sure. Uh, what what are some of the the more really puzzling um, aspects of this story that stood out to you? Well, you know, there's lots of them. And some of them are in a way harder to fit into the overall narrative, if you like, of the story, as I understand it, as it's presented to me. Um, and that's okay, because it's not my job really to judge what's in and what's out. It's just to collate them and research them and I guess try to make sense of them. So for example, uh, there were some kids from a nearby school from a school in the neighboring suburb of Springvale who were in the Grange at the time. For some reason, they weren't at school that day, apparently. Uh, whether their term had finished a day early, I'm not sure, but they, for some reason, they were in the Grange. And this fellow who contacted me said he was up in a tree at the Grange and his older brother and his mates were riding scramble bikes around the Grange, which was something that happened a lot in those years there was a scramble that had been developed in amongst the, the trees at the Grange. And he was in a tree and noticed this flying saucer coming down. And uh, he watched it. He watched it come down and looked as though it had landed or, or almost landed. Witnesses sometimes talk about seeing the object land and they're saying that not necessarily that it touched the ground necessarily, but it came down close to the ground and appeared to be on or near the ground. And he was one of the witnesses who remembered that. And uh, it was there for some time. He was in the tree, in a sense, hiding, watching this incredible event take place and then watched it as it lifted up. I think he remembers it turning to its side and flying away at great speed. And then his brother and his mates came racing over to say that... Uh, for the time that the object was on the ground or near the ground that their bikes wouldn't start. The engines had stopped, they couldn't get them to start again and it was only when the UFO flew off and flew away that they could start their engines again. So hmm. that's a pretty unusual turn of events. Yeah, unusual and, a, and a, common, a common thread throughout a lot of these um, uh, sightings or reports. 
That's right. The idea that stories that you hear of close encounters with these UFOs stopping the engines of cars and other vehicles and while the UFOs there, start car can't be started and once it departs, you can start the car again. You hear a lot of those sort of stories mm. as you go through the, the UFO lore, if you like. Mm. Um, a really interesting connection to the story for me personally, and it's one that I didn't actually unravel until many years later into my research and just a few years now ago now was um, the boy who had gone home that day and told his parents about what he'd seen at Westall State School. And because of that, I then knew the story from the lady that I lived with. I didn't know at the time, but he was one of the witnesses that I had come across in my research. And I had collated his story and recorded it, never knowing who he was in relation to my friend. And after I and we realized our common connection through my friend Alva, he told me the story that he had heard from my friend Alva that her own mother at around the same time in 1966, living in the house that they then lived in, in Glen and Waverley, had been looking out the kitchen window and looking towards the high tension electricity power lines that ran um, near the back of her property in Glen Waverley there. They're still there today and of course they're in a way connected to the they're part of the network that connects them with the high tension power lines that are at Westall as well. And uh, this lady, my friend's mother, who was a very devout, straight laced uh, Christian lady, um, I remember seeing this at quite close range UFO sitting just beyond her back fence near these power lines and seeing one or two humanoid type creatures sitting inside the craft and it being there for some time and then zipping off. Now, I actually have no memory of my friend Elva me, but I presume her mother had told her at some point and maybe that was part of her own interest in what had happened at Westall. But that was something that I never knew until this boy at Westall State School who had been there that day and who I had made contact with as one of my witnesses shared that story with me. Mm. An actual human, like humanoid figure. Um, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a game changer right there. <laughs> um, as, as... That's right. And, and whether, whether it has any connection with what happened at Westall, who knows, but apparently it was around the same time and geographically, of course, in a very similar location. And the object that was seen apparently by my friend's mom had that classic flying saucer shape. So, you know, mm. some in some way or form connected, I think you would have to say. There was another witness that claimed... To prove it, of Sorry. Um, there was another witness that claimed that they said they saw a humanoid figure exit the Westall UFO very briefly as it landed in the Grange. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So in some years into my research, I noticed a, a video on YouTube that was about, um, I can't quite remember now whether it was about Westall specifically or uh, UF UFOs in general, and a lady had posted a comment to the YouTube video saying that her dad had been there at Westall High that day and had seen something which had really shaken him up and um, he doesn't like to talk about it. And she was either reaching out to speak to somebody about it or she was just making the comment. Anyway, I saw the comment and I reached out to her and eventually it led to us making contact with each other. And she told me the story about her dad, John, that um, his wife, her mum had come home with one day with a book from an op shop. And the book was about uh, paranormal phenomena and UFO stories and ghost stories. And it was a book by a very well-known author and journalist in Melbourne over many years, a fellow called John Pinckney. And in that book, which I have here in my collection, actually, uh, there are a couple of sections that deal with the Westall incident. And uh, her mother to her husband, John, John, 
Westall High School. You were at Westall High School in 1966, weren't you? And that led to a conversation about what John remembered. And it was the story that John had in detail never talked about with anybody, hadn't shared it with his wife, hadn't shared it with his kids. And eventually John and I made contact with each other and John tells the rather extraordinary story that's not a story that's shared really by many other witnesses, but it's a story that he tells and he swears by it and he knows that it sounds crazy and he knows that sharing the story will make him seem perhaps crazy. But the story was that he was doing a run uh, through the Grange. It wasn't an official cross-country PE um, lesson run. It was just one that he'd asked his teacher at the time. He was preparing for a cross-country run that was coming up. Could he go and do a bit of training? And in those days, the rules about those sort of things were a bit more lackadaisical. And apparently his teacher said, yeah, sure, no problems, go for a run. And so off he went to the Grange, which was an area that the kids at Westall High School did use for running. And as he was coming back to the school through the Grange, he saw this flying saucer come down. And there were a couple of others that he saw. They were up high, staying distant. But this one came down, came down and it seemed to land. And uh, a door opened. And from where he could, he was hiding behind these bushes or long grass. And from where he was hiding, he saw this figure come down what looked like a ramp and he could only see the bottom half of the figure. So basically up to the, the hips area, if you like. He couldn't see uh, beyond that. And the figure seemed to be human-like, it seemed to be wearing a suit, uh, some sort of silver close-fitting suit, but not one that you would normally associate, he said to me, with a pilot or an astronaut. It was somehow different from that. And the figure moved around a little bit, took a few steps, seemed to be looking around at something. That's the impression that he got. And then went back up the ramp. The, the object lifted up, moved into a different orientation, and then joined the other two that were up higher, and they all basically disappeared in a flash. Mm. He doesn't remember any other kids that were around at the time. He didn't expect to see any others because he thought he was the only one doing that particular run that day. He went back to school. He was rather shocked, as you can imagine. He met a fellow in a uniform. It appeared to be an army uniform um, at the back of the school property on Fairbank Road, which in those days was the front of Westall State School and the rear of Westall High School and it separated the school properties from the market gardens that, that then led into the Grange area. And um, this fellow in a uniform standing on the dirt road wanted to know if he'd seen anything and he just said no. And the fellow was very gruff, very abrupt and said get back to school. And so he went back to school, that's where he was going anyway. And uh, there were more uh, soldiers or military type figures there and body if he'd seen anything and he had decided there and then that there was no way he was going to share with them uh, what he had seen because he knew people would think he was mad or they would subject him to questioning or he'd get into trouble somehow and so he kept quiet and there was a school assembly later on in the afternoon he has memories of there being people there from the government, again in uniforms, military figures, along with the headmaster, and uh, asking for people to uh, come forward if they had seen anything, but he didn't. And in fact, as the story goes, as he tells it, he stayed, he kept that secret, he stayed quiet for years, literally until just the last few years when he started sharing the story very hesitantly, very uh, um, quietly in a way with me and with a few other people on Facebook. Mm. 
It seemed if he was running around the Grange, the pine foresty kind of area of parkland, it seems plausible to me that uh, being there as it landed, uh, there would have been a bit of time lapse between all the other student witnesses jumping the fence, running over. It, it seems pretty plausible that they probably would have arrived a bit after it's actually landed. So he, there is a good chance he would have seen something that was missing from a lot of the other witnesses if he was on the site as it exactly took place. Um, yeah, interesting. I mean, pretty pretty compelling and fascinating. Um, just, I mean, I just almost not as mind blowing, but nearly as mind blowing as the incident itself is the kind of cover up, the quick response to the um, people. Uh, like the military people, the jeeps turning up, um, you know, really, really fast response. Um, I was wondering if you could give us, I, I've, I've heard a few people mention this, one of the students called Tanya. I'm wondering if you could give us an overview of who Tanya was and what happened there. Sure. So there were lots of, uh, there were a few students um, who had memories of two or three of their schoolmates, the other adversely affected by what they'd seen that day. And one of the names that came up with quite a few people, for those who could remember a specific name, some would just remember that there was a girl student. Um, but one of the names was Tanya. And Tanya was a student um, in... Uh, Form 1, what we now call Year 7. I think I have that right from memory. So she was about uh, 12, 13 years old. And the story that was told by others was that they remembered Tanya rushing over to the Grange and getting quite close to one of the flying saucers as it was on or near the ground. And then coming back to the school uh, in a upset state and so there were a couple of students who, who told that particular story but there were quite a few other students who remembered that something had happened to Tanya that she must have got quite co quite close to whatever it was because she became quite hysterical was affected and faint was back at school or at school and people quite a few people had memories of an ambulance coming to the school, Tanya being scooped up by the ambulance officers and put into the ambulance and taken away. And people didn't remember Tanya coming back to school again. Now, the incident happened on the second last day of term one. The next day was the last day. Then it went into the Easter holidays and the break between term one and term two. So just over two weeks of holidays. And so when school resumed, a couple of weeks later, Tanya wasn't there. And people, of course, wondered what on earth had happened to her. And in the documentary that was made by Rosie Jones, a couple of the students shared the memory, one student in particular who was a friend of Tanya's, of going around to her house which was just around the corner from where she lived, which she knew quite well because she'd been there several times, and knocking on the door and uh, inquiring about Tanya and being told by someone who she'd never seen before there anymore. And, uh, and she never saw her friend Tanya again. And so there was this story around Tanya and what had happened to her. And um, years later, uh, eventually, Tanya made the decision to uh, come out and talk about what had happened to her. And I finally got to communicate directly with Tanya and I got to meet her. And her take on the event is different. Her memories of the event are different. She actually, although she remembers very clearly seeing the UFO, and she remembers clearly going down to the Grange, racing after it. She doesn't remember it being there when she arrived. And she has no memory of how she got back to the school. And she has no memory of, on that particular day, being taken to hospital. But some weeks or months later, 
she said to me that, and this was after she had read accounts by other students who did have those memories, and she'd seen the Westall 66 documentary as well, and she knew what account had been given of her in that. She said to me that, Sybil, that it happened, and that for some reason she had either forgotten about it or it had been blacked out from her memory. Um, so she was willing to concede that. Um, and really that's where the story remains. It is true, however, that she did leave the school because not long afterwards her mother, uh, her family moved from where they were living just near the school to a neighbouring suburb uh, to move into a different house and to go to a different school. So it's true that she didn't return, but that was simply because apparently, according to Tanya, that her family moved house and she moved schools. Sure. So that that disappearance doesn't necessarily have to be as you know nefarious as the uh, the powers that be relocating her. It, it probably was a bit more of a normal explanation there. Well, that's Tanya's take on it, absolutely. Um, mm. She doesn't think there's anything nefarious about it. Um, the one or two girls who remember going around to Tanya's house were just bemused because somebody answered the door that they'd never seen before. Um, and they weren't, so they didn't quite understand how all those pieces fitted together. But um, yes, according to Tanya's memory of it now, it's, it doesn't sound like it was nefarious at all. But mm. there are other elements of the story that, that Tanya certainly remembers. And, and for example, she remembers going into the office and being grilled by these two people uh, with short cropped hair and uh, suits and obviously two guys from the government. And her memory of them now is that they actually had American accents. And so for her, her memory is that these two people were somehow representatives of the American authorities, whether they were from the military or perhaps connected to the Consulate General uh, in Melbourne or the American Embassy here in Canberra, but they were grilled. Or she was grilled by these two people. Um, and they said to her, what you've experienced is something very important, but for the security of Australia, it is very important that you not talk about what you've seen that um, in order to keep Australia's story to yourself. Mm. And uh, she remembers thinking at the time that they were spinning a yarn, that they were trying to pull the wool over her eyes, that the story they were presenting to her really in no way matched the truth of what it was that she had seen that day, that they were trying to present some sort of narrative to her as she would understand it now, to cover over what it was that had actually happened and to ensure that she kept her mouth closed. And as she said to me when we finally got to communicate directly, Shane, I kept that promise, if you like. I kept that promise and I never spoke about it. She never even told her mum when she went home that day or in the, in the succeeding weeks, months or years she never shared it with her other family members. And it wasn't until very recently when things started coming out about the UFO phenomena in the media developments in the US Congress and various whistleblowers and the article in the New York Times in 2017 and that she felt like it was okay now for her to talk about it. She's really quite happy to talk about it to a certain extent. She doesn't really care about the ramifications She's not afraid of it, of it anymore and she's not feeling obliged to keep any secrets anymore because to her mind, uh, the greater reality of whatever it is that's behind the UFO phenomena seems to be coming out um, into the public arena anyway. So she feels emboldened now to, to talk more about it. So exactly on, on that with these recent uh, congressional hearings coming out of the United States, uh, a huge, huge, you know, move step forward in in regards to some form of disclosure. If we're going to believe that these people are telling the truth, which I, I personally do, but there's a lot of scepticism out there, especially considering the United States is, well, 
regarding this subject, the entire thing has been shrouded in secrecy. It's, it's never been transparent. So why would they be telling the truth now? I mean, I, I understand that. But nonetheless, if if these things are coming out, if, um, you know, Grush, the, the whistleblower, is uh, reporting that uh, his his um, research and him poking around has, con has confirmed that there are non-human exotic crafts with non-human biologics being being retrieved um so so much of the secrecy around this subject has been been because of america brick walling everything um if it's now coming into a, a time when the stigma is being lifted the subject is no longer taboo to talk about uh do you think that we could be closer regarding the westall incident to getting getting some answers for what happened i mean uh, rapid fire first of all what roadblocks did you face in in your research and um also who would we who would we apply pressure to to get an official statement about this incident well in terms of roadblocks i guess the the, the most important roadblock has been my focus from the very beginning apart from listening to and hearing the stories of the witnesses and and respecting them and recording them and obviously that's very important it's anecdotal um, but it's evidence uh, you know the importance of stories uh, our whole civilization culture is built on stories um, stories that might be literally true or not or they could have some other sort of truth in them um, but I also wanted, of course, the hard evidence because, you know, mm. I'm a researcher and I want to know the truth of what happened at Westall. And I want to know the truth for the people who were there who want to know the truth after all these years still. And so I've always been on the paper chase, not just chasing the people who were there that day in authority. And that's been another important aspect of the research, but getting that government document, that documentary evidence that would say without any doubt that yes, this particular government agency, this particular government department, these particular government officers, officers, be the personnel, be they federal or state, were there that day. And this is what they saw. This is what they learnt. This is what they concluded. And so when the documentary television in Australia in 2010, I was contacted through the filmmakers by the daughter of a very high ranking Australian federal public servant who worked for this huge, very important government department called the Department of Supply, which was really part of the, uh, the military. It was the department that was set up to procure things, objects, weapons, uniforms, rations, equipment, vehicles for the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, what would now be part of the wider Department of Defence or specifically the Defence Science and Technology Organisation, that the basically fourth equal highest ranking public servant in that department had been intimately involved in the response to Westall that day, according to his daughter and as I later found out from his other children as well and that uh, he was completely baffled by what he had discovered at Westall and that he was very disappointed that he couldn't, more than disappointed, he was furious that he couldn't share with the wider public what had happened and that pressure had been brought to bear upon him by the people above him, of which there weren't many, but the people who were above him were powerful for example, I imagine, I don't know for sure, of course, the secretary of the department or the minister involved, the minister responsible for the department, for example, that he keep his mouth shut about this, um, that there was concern around his and the department's reputation if they be linked to this story because the department was involved, he personally was involved apparently in negotiations with other countries to have them purchase our military hardware, our military inventions. 
And as it turned out, after more research and more pieces of the puzzle being put together, he had been picked up every day that week from his home in Melbourne by a government car um, and taken not to his office in Swanston Street in Melbourne, but taken in the opposite direction and out to Westall and had gone out, he'd gone out there, come back again to home. And at night at home, his children remember him sitting around the kitchen table and penning the report for the department about what had happened at Westall, um, what he and the government authorities who responded had discovered. And uh, that report obviously went somewhere and it seems that he probably made and kept a copy for his own personal records. But unfortunately, after he passed away, just a few short years later in 1970, after the department and his family had moved from Melbourne to Canberra, um, upon his passing, his wife followed his request that after he died, all those personal and important documents be thrown into the incinerator in the backyard in their home in Canberra. And apparently that's what happened. And apparently the Westall report, his copy of it, went into that incinerator as well. That really sucks. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I felt <laughs> sorry as well. <laughs> do, do you have and any... I can tell you, sorry, I've go, stood go in front of that house here in Canberra and I've stared into the house and stared into the backyard of that house. It's still there today. And just tried to put myself back there at that time and, and imagine that those documents being thrown into the fire and just wishing that it hadn't happened and wishing that I'd been around at that time and or that somebody else had and that we'd had that conversation and met up and, and, and saved that document. And, but that's not what happened, unfortunately. Do you have any idea about what the department is? What the department is? Mm, the department that you, you speak of? You mean the name of the department? Right. Yeah, so the name of the department was, was the Department of Supply. Supply, right, okay. Mm. Yeah, and supply was that huge department which was responsible for making sure that the Australian Defence Force, as we call it now, the Army, Air Force and Navy, was kept supplied with all the things that they needed, stationery and uniforms up to aircraft and guided missiles and electronic systems, they did the whole lot. So mm. it was a very important department and his role was a very important one as well. Given given the, the change in tune, as I was mentioning before, you know, with the congressional hearings, the whistleblowers, the leaked footage, the seeming acknowledgement uh, of people within the US military, do, do you think that we are likely to get any answers about this incident? Uh, I mean, I would have thought no, but given the change of tune, it seems that the US is the main um, force that wants to keep, you know, keep all this, uh, uh, you know, pre pretty secret. So uh, do, do you think that now might be an opening of, of getting any information so the people that witnessed the, uh, this event might get any kind of closure before, before their time, you know, before it's too late? Mm. Yes, that's right. And that was part of your question before, which was very important. And look, I'm an optimist. You have to be an optimist in this field, I think, because the Westall story is like, in some ways, all of those other real standing UFO stories that, you know, people know about, the, the more famous ones, if you like, like Roswell or Rendlesham or the, the Nimitz um, encounter or any of the ones over the years that are still after all these years and after all this research that's gone into them, um, all the effort, all the money that's gone into researching them by so many people are still unsolved and are still mysterious. And Westall's one of those. But as a researcher, I feel as though you have to be optimistic. And even though, and it's always been the case that I've been racing the undertaker 
because this is a story that's 57 years old. And most of the people who were there that day who were with the government, who may have been in a position to know something because they were dispatched, whether they were with the Department of Supply or another government agency, um, the soldiers who were there, their officers, uh, the people who were seen removing dirt from the location of one of the circles and throwing into the back of a lorry and it being carted away. The people who were jumping out of their lorries with things that look like metal detectors and uh, Geiger counters and shovels and, and removing the dirt and later burning the grass where the circles were. A lot of effort went into whatever it was that was this response to this incident. And I guess most of those people were of an age where now if they're not passed away, they may be at an age where they just don't have much in the way of memories anymore. But hmm. I live in hope that some of those people are still around. And as I often say to people, it only takes one or two people to come forward and whether it's a deathbed confession or something similar to finally share and talk about their piece of the puzzle and, and what they saw. And hopefully with this gradual but quite powerful uh, change that's going on at the moment, that's certainly you know focused in America, focused on Washington, I guess, that it will hopefully lead to the dam wall beginning and that other countries, not just America, our own country, Australia, will hopefully feel as though it can start talking at the official, at the governmental, at the intelligence, at the defence level, more and more about what's happened over the years and what we know and, and what we've discovered and what was concluded. Mm. And I'm hopeful that that is happening and will continue to happen. Yeah, me too. <clears throat> Um, we don't have a whole lot of time left, but I would love to, just in the remaining time, ask you about this other case that you've been engrossed in lately, uh, which you've coined the Westall Doppelganger, the, um, a, a similar um, sighting uh, involving a, uh, was it a primary school? Can, can, can you give us an overview of, of, of what, what's that all about? Well, it all depends on how many school-based UFO stories you're willing to um handle or cope with because oh, over the years I'm here for it. I've had people contact me of course um, so there's quite a uh, a lot of people have contacted me over the years and shared with me incident happening at their schools and um, so just in Australia alone I now got a list here somewhere of there being 10 schools in addition to Westall that people have contacted me about where UFO incidents have happened between the mid fifties up to about 1970 and um, wow. four schools in South Australia. And at the moment I'm looking into one that I've just recently added to my list, which also happened in suburban Melbourne in the Eastern suburbs around um, somewhere around 1966, 69 in that sort of time frame. And gradually I'm unearthing some witnesses who are coming forward and talking to me about what happened and in some ways it's very similar to what was seen at Westall and it may have been in fact at the same time or around a similar time but the doppelganger case is one which happened in the suburb of Miami one year to the day after the Westall incident so the 6th of April 1967 it involved a primary school called Crestview Elementary School and literally hundreds of kids several students several teachers in broad daylight saw these objects flying in and around the school uh, over a property uh, on the other side of the school where there were a grove of trees, uh, a big paddock we would call it in the Australian parlance and the objects flying in and out of the trees, landing, the police coming to the school, the Air Force coming to the school and it has so many elements that are resonant of what happened at Westall, um, including the involvement of a science teacher, that I began to refer to it as the doppelganger, that 
twin, if you like, for Westall that happened on the other side of the world in the suburbs of a city, like in Melbourne, in this case Miami, and on the same day, but a year later. And that's a story that I've been researching for a few years now. And my research eventually led to that uh, story, along with the Westall story, being included in a television program that was put together by the Discovery Channel in Canada called Close Encounters. And they devoted a couple of episodes to both the Westall and the Crestview cases. And um, I've now with dozens and dozens of those Crestview kids, now adults, of course, and they've been kind enough to share their memories of what happened at their school. And as I say, the what happened and the response to it, so similar to what happened at Westall. And of course, it leaves me as the researcher and anybody who listens to the story and who pays any attention to it to wonder what on earth is going on and what on earth was going on back in 1966 and 1967. So when you put it like that with all those simul similarities, I just instantly go from thinking it's aliens to it's a glitch in the matrix or a simulation fault, you know? <laughs> The simulation theory is grumbling. Just <laughs> we're on repeat. Um, Some sort of time slip, or whatever it was. These beings, people, phenomena. It came back, as we interpret it, a year later in a different part of the planet. But you know, who knows? It all, all depends on what's behind the phenomena, of course, as to what you then go and conclude in relation to uh, a couple of cases like this. And and of course, the Crestview case for me also remains this incredible mystery. But, you know, I get like a fellow who shared with me um, that he had a friend that he knew very well who lived in the Crestview neighbourhood at the time who later went on to work in mission control for NASA there in, in Florida. And as a kid, his friend, he told him the story, had been riding around the streets around Crestview and uh, he'd heard of the story of the incident happening and he saw a landed flying saucer in front of him, sort of in the paddock next to the street where he was riding his bike and, uh, and saw it lift up and fly away again. And you have to wonder, you know, what sort of effect that had on that boy who then later went on to become, uh, to have a career working for NASA and what was in the back of his mind, what was in his, his subconscious or his conscious all those years later as an adult as he remembered that story that had happened to him as a kid and that mm. resonates so much with of course what happened at Westall as well I mean so so much of this subject uh, you, for, first of all I, I do re I really appreciate how um, you know true you are to the facts uh, uh, when 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 you uh, address all this well, I think we it is uh, it's it's less um, fantastical but it's very ne needed in this field because it, it it does get very wacky very quickly in so many different directions and and i'm finding uh you know really really diving into this subject uh a bit more deeply recently it 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 just gets very supernatural i'm, I'm putting all of my disbeliefs and critical thinking uh just just on hold <laughs> at the moment just to see what's kind of coming out um with these you know, big groundbreaking leaks and things, but how how do you decipher, you know, the, the, the difference between the supernatural aspect and then the nuts and bolts? How, how do you decipher what to reject and what to take on? Because, you know, you, you, even with these school cases, you've got instances of telepathy. Um, with with all these orb sightings, if, uh, it, it gets, with the Stephen Greer kind of stuff, it gets very much into intention setting and summoning, and then these things somehow can can read your intention through med meditation and orbs come down. Like it's all really bizarre. I mean, usually I just be like, sure. Okay. Whatever. But there's a lot of them, you know, there, there, there's a lot of this stuff. Um, how, how do you, how do you decipher? How do you, how do you get through the reads of, of it all with, with your research? Well, I think, you know, like most people, I get stuck in the reads and mm. I get, uh, you know, off, I go off on some strange, barely beaten path because there are so many rabbit holes when it comes to this sort of phenomena. 
and I guess I try to sort of stay on the straight and narrow as much as I can and, and to stay with the facts. But the more that one reads and watches and talks to people, you realise that um, the nature of this phenomena, whatever it is, uh, its boundaries are pretty murky. And of course, everything's interconnected. And, you know, I like to, I have to say to people, the supernatural, it's just the natural that we haven't come to terms with yet. It's the natural mm. world that we haven't yet discovered, that we haven't yet got um, our bearings on. Because there's only one world. There's only one nature. There's only one science. There's only one sense. And everything somehow has to fit together. And it's just that things come along, present to us in history and um, that, that don't fit together that um uh what's the word they confuse us and bemuse us and we can't make sense of them and and we put certain labels on them and we try to understand them and we, we try to pigeonhole them as a way of trying to comprehend what we're perceiving or what we've heard and we may be doing that incorrectly of course because we're grappling in the dark but eventually we get to a point hopefully where we have a greater understanding of what it is that we're perceiving, but it's a very gradual thing. But for me, um, you know, obviously the, the woo factor, as it's often referred to, um, yeah, it's there, it's around, but I just try to stay with the facts and try to keep to the nuts and bolts, if you like, but sometimes you get drawn towards the nuts rather than the bolts. Mm, and I guess mm. it's always going to be a mixture of the two. Um, but as a researcher, as I say, I try to stay on the state on the straight and narrow. You know, you have to be open. You have to be skeptical. I'm a skeptic in hopefully the, the true sense of the word, not in terms of being a debunker, but uh, being a skeptic in terms of being open minded and searching for the truth and weighing everything up and not dismissing things out of hand. Um, and going wherever the evidence leads. And if the evidence leads towards the seemingly extraterrestrial, however you define that, whether it's another planet or another dimension or um, another world that exists within our, our planet, um, you go there if the evidence goes that way. But you stay open to the other possibilities as well until you can find a, a proper conclusion. But you know, it's challenging, and um, I, I grew up as a Catholic. I'm still a Catholic. And so I guess from the beginning, I've always been open to the, to the beyond, to the mm. so-called supernatural, because as a Christian, as a person of faith, you already believe in that which you can't necessarily see or define. You believe in the divine. You believe in things like angels. You believe in there being a life after this life. You believe as I do, that life somehow continues. Um, and so when you start from that starting point, you're sort of already open to things. And I have said in other interviews that I think one of the reasons I got put on this path initially, and I often wonder why and how I ended up on this path and ended up being the person who has sort of concentrated on this particular story and the ones that are connected to it, is my dad died when I was one year old. And so I grew up without a father, but all, always had the sense that, well, my dad's not with me anymore, but he's somewhere. And um, I could feel his absence, but I could also, in a sense, feel his abiding presence somewhere, that he continued to live, but somewhere else. And that was the case for everyone else in my family and every other family who had passed on. And so there was that sense that for me, there was a world of things that were unseen. And just because they were unseen, it didn't mean they weren't really important um, or that they didn't have a impact or influence or importance to me. Um, and so I guess growing up like that, as lots of other people do, if I grow up in a you know, a religious family, but they Catholic or Muslim or Buddhist or otherwise, um, you have that openness to the other. 
um, and that there's more to the world than we see. Uh, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't pursue it and try to appraise it with science and logic and, and rationality, because uh, that's important as well, because it's all part of the same thing. It's all part of the, the, um, of life, of the, of the human adventure, mm. which is me getting very philosophical now, of course. That's but, great. Um, I think philosophy plays a part as well. Yeah, I mean, this subject the love does of meaning the search for for meaning. Yeah, it. I mean, it, it kind of just links so many things together. This subject, it's it's really strange. But if if you look at almost all 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 of the religions, it, it does get very uh, mystical, mythical, metaphysical, um, supernatural. Uh, ancient ancient cultures, you know, the. Egyptians and the and the Mayans and and so so many ancient ancient culture uh, cultures with the you know, Tibetan Book of the Dead and things. It, it's all mm. it's all pretty out there for our scientifically modern minds. Um, is it all rubbish? I mean, given how long these things have stood the test of time, uh, would almost suggest that this new, very very scientifically way of viewing things is 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 more of the anomaly than than the mystical um yeah interesting yeah anyway we are out of time shane it has been an absolute pleasure this could be a uh, this could be a three-hour conversation um but we'll leave it there for now <laughs> thank you i feel like we've just scratched the surface even um, in relation to the Westall story scratch the surface so yeah i'm yeah. sorry for my uh for, for my ramblings and not being more direct with you but i really appreciate your interest in the story and and my part in it i really appreciate that and and likewise we really appreciate the the work you're doing and i stay very very hopeful that now is a a, a shift in the collective consciousness towards the subject and um maybe just maybe we might get some answers for some of these specific cases but anyway shane thank you so much um where would people find you if they want to um dive into some some of your work sure so there's a facebook group for the westall flag saucer incident which you can find very easily on facebook and you can certainly contact me through facebook as well and there's lots of links in that group to all manner of things various videos and articles and links and maps and stories and photos that have been amassed on that group page over many years Lots of things have been contributed by me, but also by other people, other researchers, and by the witnesses themselves. So have a look at that. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Take care. Bye.